Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm interviewing Richard Hubley in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. How are you, Richard? I'm good, thank you. Very well. Thank you for joining the chats. Pleasure to be here. How's uh, winter coming along for you there in the Great White North? Well, it was white. It snowed overnight. (laughs) It's melting, but it's, yeah, just a dusting. Okay, well, hang in there. Okay. First of all, Richard, would you tell us a little bit about your where you're from and your growing up? I was an army brat, or st- still am, I guess, uh, born uh, in Pembroke, Ontario, because I was raised on Canadian Forces Base Petawawa, uh, which is in the Ottawa Valley, about three hours from, from Ottawa. But for an army brat, you didn't move around a whole lot. No, uh, when uh, when we were we were posted about thirty times to large Germany and other places uh, over time, but because my mom was in a wheelchair, uh, we our the leaves or the postings kept getting cancelled. Once we got rid of our animals, <laughs> always after the animals were gone. So. The army didn't move you very often because of your mother's situation. Correct. the The final posting that uh, uh, came through, we moved from CFB Petawawa to Canadian Forces Base Rockcliffe, which is here in Ottawa. What was your impression of the military as you were growing up? I loved it. All these hyper masculine men. Parade, literally parading around me. It was wonderful. <laughs> what about it did you love? Uh, the, their camaraderie, their, uh, the discipline, and uh, the, uh, the uniforms. <laughs> of course. The uniforms are a little different from what people in the United States might know. Yes. Uh, the we don't have as elaborate of, um, uh, of fatigues as the American, the Americans have. Uh, so when they were in Iraq, they still used their forest green ones. So, uh, they were easy to spot as opposed to the American and the, uh, Brown camouflage. So <laughs> why do you think they were doing that? Uh, it was just, just what they had at the time. You did mention that you really liked the discipline and the regimental intrigue. Talk yes. Tell us a little bit more about that. When I was younger, the, the discipline and the mentorship and sometimes going from in through the ranks and stuff uh, and the precision of the shine of the boots. Uh, at the time, I didn't realize the love of boot blacking and stuff like this, but I, I appreciate it now, and it's a skill I'm still learning even after all these years. Uh, the trying to identify the different skins and knowing what product to use on it is still a work in progress, but I'm still working on it. Growing up in that environment... How did you begin to evolve knowing that you were gay? We had a military friend that was, uh, was gay and after like, you know, was friends with my mother and my father, they were in the same unit together as my father and Mark, my friend Martin. And, uh, after a while, uh, the military back then gave him an honorable discharge because uh, similar to the mili- the uh, Americans don't ask, don't tell, they, you know, it was frowned upon back then. This was in the 60s, 70s. How did this come about that they discovered he was gay? Or do you know? Or- I, I don't know the, uh, the 
the backstory to it, but Martin's always been open. So what kind of an influence did he have on your life? Um, I wouldn't say it was something to expire to, but it was, it was something that I knew was around. And uh, at the time when we were growing up, I didn't understand what a homosexual was, et cetera. Not until my teens that I figured that out. How did you figure it out? Um, going to the smoke shops and looking at the adult magazines uh, I was tall for my for my age, so I looked the part, and uh, my uh, sort of gravitated towards the uh, men's magazines after a time. Do you remember which magazines you were viewing? In touch, Honcho, <laughs> to name a few, the nice ones. <laughs> And these were readily available on the shelf, or did you have to ask for them? No, they were on the shelf. Okay. And did anybody question you about this? Tell you, hey, put those away? Or No, but unbeknownst to me is my friend Martin and the owner of the smoke shop knew each other. <laughs> oh. So he talked to Martin and Martin talked to my mother and... <laughs> So I didn't have to tell her I was gay. I confirmed I was. <laughs> How did she take that? Fine. Okay. Well, uh, for those who have seen Queer as Folk and have seen Debbie, the quintessential P-flag mother, that's my mother. <laughs> that's quite something for a woman of her generation and uh, demographics. Yes. How do you uh, feel she came to that? Just by knowing a lot of different people, different ethnicities, different sexualities. Um, the, you know, uh, she was a member, you know, they became members of UFMCC, uh, which is the United Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches. Right. And uh, there, there were two chapters here in Ottawa, but they have since both closed. They weren't at the same time, but they tried to start one here and it, it closed. And then a few years later, they tried another time with another pastor. So. At what point did you officially come out? Uh, fully, probably when I was in my late teens. Okay. Uh, didn't advertise it, but didn't hide it either. Tell us about the scene that you experienced when you came out. Um, there were a number of gay bars here in Ottawa. Um, I had known through my friend Martin and a whole bunch of other people. I had known the, uh, I have known the oldest bar in Ottawa. Uh, it's since closed about uh, 10 years ago was 166B on Laurier Street, and uh, it was the longest-running gay bar. It was above a restaurant. Oh. Uh, um, there have been, at one point, maybe eight bars total in the, uh, in the Ottawa community, and now it's down, uh, even pre-pandemic, to about four. Now, what kind of a bar was, I'm sorry, it was? Uh, 166B was a leather denim bar. Okay. It was the home of the Ottawa Knights. Okay. And the longest, the other longest running bar, uh, which just closed about eight years ago, was fondly referred to as the oral grief but it was called the coral reef uh and it was a lesbian drag bar oh my gosh what were your thoughts upon first going into a leather levi type bar i'm home 
I felt comfortable. A um, little overwhelmed with the um, visual stimulation, let's say. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, I've grown to get used to it after all this time. Uh, here in Ottawa, the uh, one sixty six B was the home bar of the Ottawa Knights before they moved to Centertown Pub. It has since closed, and now we're almost we're just down the street from there at T's Pub, uh, which is a it's more of a a bias free. It's owned by a drag queen, and it's very biased free. But there's drag and lesbian. Uh, uh, there's a whole gamut of people that go there. So, um, but we're, but the uh, Ottawa Knights have been around since 1975, and I knew a lot of them. So, and I've when I joined the Ottawa Knights, I'm the vice president of the Ottawa Knights, and I've been with them for 34 years now. Take us back to the beginning of that. How mm -hmm. did you learn about the Ottawa Knights? How did you know what kind of an organization they are? Through friends and through seeing them around in the community and seeing the work they do. Okay. Uh, the camaraderie and the fundraising for the uh, agencies around Ottawa uh, the two AIDS uh, organizations and uh, through our uh, Ottawa Leather Weekend, we, the title holder gets to pick where the benef who the beneficiary is. So we've had the main society, we had the Special Olympics and all these other type of uh, organizations also be beneficiaries of our fundraising. Take me back a little further. Mm -hmm. Tell us how they came to be. They were formed in 75 by five people with an interest into the leather denim scene. Uh, I know of some of the long, uh, the founding members, but I don't know the exact history of you know, their background story. So I, I can't elaborate too far on, on, it's just that they were all of like-minded people that wanted a, you know, a, a club here in Ottawa. What was your first impression of the group? Uh, I love, I loved the, what they were doing and how they were doing it. Um, and even with my uh, disability, it didn't persuade them from accepting me fully when I applied to become a pledge. You were young then. I was 24. Okay. How were you received as a relatively young person coming into the scene? No, no problem. I... They were very welcoming. They, they didn't, there wasn't any ageism or anything like that back then. Um, it was the fact that, you know, you liked the leather or the denim and you loved what or liked and brought skills to help make the club better. Um, you know, with my administration skills and what I know about finances and stuff. I, uh, you know, with throughout the time with the club, I've been secretary, I've been treasurer, I, you know, and uh, president and vice president, currently vice right now. How long have you been the vice president? Uh, it th it's going on three years, but the pandemic hasn't helped because we haven't been able to. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 You said you, you'd been president at least once. Mm -hmm. When was that? Uh, six years ago. Okay. How long did you hold that? For a year. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. We have our elections in January. Okay. 
Uh, is are you planning to hold that in January coming up? We've talked about it, but we we still don't know how. Uh, if the spaces we would use for our meetings are still going to be open, we usually meet at the um, Bruce House, which is the uh, AIDS housing project here in Ottawa, and their offices are working, but they're closed. Yeah. Therefore, the community to use their boardroom. Right. Now, how have the Ottawa Knights been able to keep up socially? Are you going to a lot of events online? We have been doing online events individually uh, throughout the pandemic. We've been meeting every two weeks. We first started on a Tuesday and then we moved it to the Wednesday uh, due to a conflict with scheduling for a lot of our members. Uh, but uh, we've been meeting, for, or we've been, we, we call it a check-in for the, for, the free 40 minute. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, social time. Okay. Yeah. Because we're, we're, because we're not uh, holding our bar nights and getting funds in. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have the funds for the a Zoom account. Has it been well attended? Predominantly, yes. We get on average. We're not. We're not the largest club now. Um, through attrition and people moving and stuff like this, we're down to about ten members and two pledges. I think. Yeah. Uh, and so we're. It's it's coming back up slowly. Um, so it's yeah, we've had more people apply over the time. So we're setting up Zoom meetings to interview them and stuff like this. Because okay. during our pledge process, we usually get them to or the pledges to start that during the six month time. It's for them. It's for the pledges and the members to get to know each other. And uh, what's been the highest uh, membership number? Twenty one. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you hold a contest in Ottawa for a title holder. Yes. Because I know you were a title holder once. C correct. Tell us about that. How are the Knights involved with that? Uh, it is our, it's our, we, help, we, we run it with the help of the community. Uh, we financially back it. Um, uh, we, the, our, the committee, organizing committee meets and, uh, it evolved from Mr. Leather Ottawa to the Ottawa Leather Weekend because we have a boot black title now. We have a fetish pup and uh, the um, Mr. Leather Ottawa competition all, all together. How has yeah. that been received? Uh, very good. It's, it's very well attended. The, we try to have at least six uh workshops over the weekend and uh uh both the gay lesbian and pansexual communities come out to to uh participate uh you know we have a leather gear swap and uh also which is extremely popular keep getting asked when we're gonna have our next one but <laughs> are there current plans well it's it's it'll coincide with our next title like title runs but yeah it's um not not right now we're looking in the horizon for it but we don't know when the horizon or when we can start the planning process because of covid right. when were you a title holder uh I ran November of 2007 and after there were five contestants and I won and became uh, Mr. Leather Ottawa 2008. And you competed at IML? At IML 30, yes. I'm in the class of IML 30. There were 62 of us from 17 countries and I was the first person in a wheelchair to compete at oh, IML. Uh, tenth overall. Oh, okay. Yeah, I made top 20 and became tenth overall. Yeah. 
You've mentioned you are in a wheelchair. Correct. How did that come about? Motorcycle accident in uh, a hit and run in 2000. And, no, not 2000. 1984. Okay. That would have had a very profound impact upon you. How did that shape your world? It really didn't affect because my mom has been in a chair and I've been around wheelchairs all my life. It didn't really phase me. Like, yes, I was upset that it, the accident happened, but the reality was I needed the chair in order to get around. So, you know, the, they did give me braces when I, the accident first happened and it was, they were bulky and cumbersome to get around with, with the crutches and stuff like this. And it was much easier to be in the wheelchair to get around and have energy left at the end of the day, as opposed to having arguments with the, with the carpet on the floor. <laughs> Gravity, my arch, my nemesis. <laughs> so you eventually segued into being in a wheelchair full time. Yes. Okay. You did mention that that transition was not as traumatic for you as it might be for someone else mm -hmm. because you grew up with your mother in similar circumstances. Yes. Uh, so my mother has spina bifida and her form of it, three of her uh, spinal discs are hollow and are fused together and the nerves that should have been in her legs were in a lump on the lower, the base of her spine referred to as a meningocele. And over time, it started getting bigger because spinal fluid would leak out. So after 42 operations, all of them saying, oh, you'll walk again. Uh, she stayed in her chair the rest of her life. Uh, but with her form of spina bifida, she was told by the doctors that she would not have any children. And as you know, I'd beaten the odds before and so did my mom and she had three kids and you know, as she put it, one of each, you know, my brother, my sister, and I, and I said, no, you need a lesbian to complete the set. So we adopted my sister, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't even know where to go with that, but smart man. <laughs> so the fact that uh, I had that type of support system around me, I didn't wallow in pity or anything like this. I adapted just like any play. It can be adapted no matter what your disabilities are, uh, whether it's uh, energy issues or uh, modifying of toys to get a better grip because of arthritis or other, other things. Uh, I do do a kink and disability workshop and talk about different things from being a diabetic to uh, with a mobility issues and aging issues. Sometimes the skin will become thinner and it may not break outright, but it's something called micro micro cracks. So you, it, it'll take time to heal, but you have to be careful of the, uh, of the surface area in certain areas, because if you're sitting a lot, not moving the legs, especially, uh, you lose your elasticity. Tell us how you developed that workshop. Uh, I was asked to do it. So I did research, uh, through some of the play I've done and, uh, online with different resources, uh, kinked resources throughout, uh, I do have a bibliography on the back, but it's been a while since I've looked at it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, because one of the things like with diabet with diabetics, especially submissives, you have to be careful of that the low, a low sugar also can be thought of the way they're acting can be 
thought of as, as subspace. So you have to be able to check to see if they're okay or if they're in trouble. So you always happen to have orange juice because fru fructose is more is easier for the body to to absorb than anything sugary. So the natural sugars are bit better. So you to help boost the sugar again, you need to have something very close by. You you did mention that toys and play can be adapted. Tell yes. us more about that. Well, if you have a, a sub that is into rope bondage and is diabetic or has back issues, you can easily modify it so that they're still tied and they get the sensation of being hung, but you can support them with pillows on a table. Uh, you can even put, leave them on the floor, but still have their arms and legs up uh, so that they're back supported because everyone wants the sessions to last a long time. And you don't want to have to call yellow or red because of the fact that the sub is not being supported so that the scene can continue. How have people responded to you when you've wanted to play? Where do you want me? Or how do you want me? Uh, when I flog, uh, I get the person to sit on a chair uh, back to me and they're cuffed and blindfolded if they so desire, but their, their arms are locked like this and they're leaning on the back of the chair. So they're at my level. Okay. When I'm getting flogged, I'm traditionally either on sitting on a spanking bench in front of the St. Andrew's cross and also secured to the cross. Okay. So it's been modified that way. Uh, the first time I was flogged uh, was seven years ago at Claw and pushing the chair all the time. My shoulders are extremely tight. And uh, when I competed at IML, there was a Mr. Bavarian leather uh, was the contestant in front of me. And there's a picture of me in the uh, uh, IML art galleries, uh, just melting as he's rubbing my shoulders. And I'm, of course, loving it. But in his broken English, he leans forward and says, you feel like coat hanger because, <laughs> because my shoulders were so tight. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But when I'm getting flogged, uh, because there's two types of flogging, there's the knock you into next week, and then there's an erotic flogging. And the erotic flogging was very intriguing to me. Uh, I had a love-hate relationship between the concept of the high, the, the, you know, the thud versus the sting. I'm starting to like the sting. <laughs> it's wearing on me. Because <laughs> uh, one, one of the things that I'm having it's the, the way my body processes it when the first sting hits and say the second sting comes like four seconds or three sec or five seconds later, my body's just processing the first hit. And then you get the second hit built on top of the reaction. So it was, we had to modify the timing of it. Oh. So it wasn't, you know, he could take me on the journey but it wasn't stacked on top of each other. It was a, it was a progressive flow as opposed to a spike. <laughs> but after the, after the two hour session, it took two months for my shoulders to tighten back up again. Wow. So I'm wheeling around, reeling around Ottawa going, someone beat me. You know? <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> but taking a brief step back, because I remember when we were talking about this interview, you mentioned that, yes, you sometimes have difficulty accessing buildings. How have you managed that when it comes to going into gay establishments or just wherever you happen to be going? Um, a lot of the time, it's like 
most of the establishments I go to besides the ones here in Ottawa are Toronto pre pandemic, but uh, I know I've been going there for so long. I just, I have their number in my phone and I, uh, or I ask security to talk to the head of security saying Frank Richards outside and they come in and I bump up the stairs and they carry my empty chair up and I climb back into it. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Sometimes it's the only time their front steps get dusted. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> are there certain activities, play activities, that are difficult for you to do or that you cannot do as a result of your limitations? The only thing that limits me is my skill level in regards to not knowing the skill. Oh. Um, because besides being a member of the Ottawa Knights, I'm also a member of, uh, Delta International Brotherhood. And, uh, uh, unfortunately I missed this year's, uh, camp or because of COVID and I couldn't drive down. I could fly for some reason, but I couldn't drive down, uh, so uh, I missed it for two years in a row, but I'll be there come hell or high water next year. But with all the medical stuff that I've done, I had no idea that needle play was one of my scenes. Tell us a yeah. bit about that. Uh, the same person who flogged me also introduced me to needle play. Uh, the first time was just in the arm and I had 10 uh, uh, needles of four different gauges. Uh, the next time I had um, 25 in my chest and we're playing in the upper dungeon of at the run and uh, he starts putting the first needle in and when he puts the second needle in. All I said, because I'm lying on a on a on a raised bed, um, that you can do just about anything from wax play on stuff. It's very multi-purpose. Uh, all I said was, "It's all coming back to me now." And he screams in the middle of the at the top of his lungs, "Hurry, pass me more needles!" The Canadians channing, channeling Celine Dion, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so people you know like i used humor for as a shield a lot of the times but a lot of my friends also use it and it makes the day go by much faster and a lot of it's easy it's better to laugh than to cry sometimes <laughs> you say you use it as a shield what does that mean well sometimes people i can sense if people are feeling uncomfortable because they see the chair first and not the person. Mm. So if I crack a joke, it puts them at ease. It's one of the reasons why Jeff Tucker asked me to be a handler with you and some of the other misfits. <laughs> let's, let's talk about that uh, mm. because it is a very important piece. Mm. But first... I'd like to explore your time as a contestant. You mentioned you were the first contestant in a wheelchair mm -hmm. to compete at IML. I would like you to talk with us about that. Yeah. Well, when I ran for my title, uh, one of my judges was Lady Caro, and she was a handler at the time for IML. And so... When I won my contest, she let them know that I was coming the following year. So they had time to prepare. And the year I competed, it was at the Regency Hotel. Everything was inside the hotel, which was nice. I didn't have to get shuttled anywhere. So that was one less thing. I didn't have to climb on a bus, mm. and et cetera. Uh, just had to fight the elevators to try and get downstairs. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it was much 
easier. But when they when I saw the way they had the grand ballroom set up with the raised platforms, they had ramps on either end, and uh, everyone else walked up the center, and I came up the sides. Uh, and they've incorporated it to the show and everything. So it was it was wonderful. But the one thing that I like is after that they kept them. Mm. Mm. You know, even not you know, and since I've competed, there have been uh, two other gen- gentlemen that have competed who are in wheelchairs. Two years after my year, <laughs> one one. <laughs> Tyler McCormick. Tyler McCormick. Yes. And uh, the last IML uh, class, Laurent, I am going to butcher his last name, but <laughs> Mr. Leather France yes. was also in a chair. Yeah. So it do was nice. Know, do you know whether IML uh, made specific accommodations or was it? something that was just coming and they they needed to do that you know anything about that it was i don't want to call them special accommodations but it was appropriate accommodations for a contestant they knew that was coming okay. uh they have because in the opening speech that uh, chuck rinslow gave he says we've had blind competitors we've had amputees we've had deaf competitors but it's taken 30 years for a man to wheel across this stage what were so, your feelings on that i was all tingly <laughs> i was i was uh, not warned but uh the person who wrote chuck's speech says i hope you don't mind but you're in it okay no i'm Honored, I guess. I had no idea what they were talking to talk to about. <laughs> How did the um, other contestants respond to you? Very well. Uh, our class was there were sixty-two people from seventeen countries, so it was, um, it, you know, there were there were groups that stayed together because we had to stay in numerical order or some, most of the time. So we didn't get to talk to everyone unless you were in the lobby mm-hmm. and things like this. So it was, uh, uh, but it was, it was very humbling and it's like took me a number of years to come to process that entire weekend because it was five days of busy, busy, busy. <laughs> When because you say it was humbling, what do you mean? Um, well, when I was growing up, I always wanted to be um, in the medical field to help people. But during my title year, I figured out and, you know, not winning and stuff like that isn't the thing isn't the quintessential of everything yes it's nice and it's a bonus but sometimes just showing up and representing you inspire people i have heard since i competed that there were people with other disabilities that are on the spectrum went and competed after me so I came home because they well, first I first met them when we, I was outside in the smoking area at uh, the Regency. Oh, we're here at IML because we saw you in Kink Crusaders, which is the which is the documentary that we were also doing during the IML Thirty weekend. So, besides being interviewed by the judges and doing everything for IML, I was also with Third Rail Productions doing King Crusaders. Yeah, that was quite something. I, I'm as fat as a house in that video. I look awful. <laughs> mm. Yeah. The, uh, so it's, you know, three young men came up to me and said, we're here because 
you you inspired me to us to be here and then a couple of years later one of them competed that was ken kennedy that's quite an honor mm -hmm. yeah like my my mother loved when i went to IML and because she'd live vicariously mm -hmm. through all the stories i came home with the first time after meeting the three guys outside and I'm like, mom i've got groupies you know <laughs> that's what she did too <laughs> like if i was to write a book with all the antidotes and stuff like this uh they would put it in fiction because half the people wouldn't believe it uh mm -hmm. one 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 summer the syracuse journeyman they don't exist anymore unfortunately had a a uh, nice little weekend get together every every year uh, called Strengthening Our Ties, where other clubs would come together, stay at a hotel, and there would just be a bar night at Shades, their home bar. <clears throat> well, I went up to get a beer, and this bar fly looked at me and asked if I was injured in NOM. I looked at him and said, do I look like I've been through a war zone? I came home to tell my mother this, and she went, do you know how old I'd be if you were injured in Nam? <laughs> how old you would have to be, too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I go to Claw and stuff like this. I'm wheeling from the host hotel to go to either the other hotel for a workshop, and I have people on the street. Thank you for your service. You're welcome. Because <laughs> I look like a wounded vet, I guess. I don't know. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I, I can't help but, but take a step back here. And when you talk about your, your disability workshop that you mentioned a little bit ago, where have you been doing that? Uh, I, uh, the first time I did it was uh, in Toronto at the Toronto, uh, Toronto Leather Weekend. Uh, and uh, I've, I also went to just outside Detroit in uh, Romulus, I think it was, it's yes. called, near the airport for the Leather Leadership Conference uh, when it was held there. Uh, I've done it twice here in Ottawa. Uh, I think I did it, yeah, I did it again a few years ago back in Toronto. Taking the step back forward here, we are both contestant handlers at IML. This is the first time this topic has come up in a chat. Would you please tell us first what the contestant handlers do at IML? The contestant handlers basically help the contestants give the first best first impression they can to either the judges or the general public when it comes to the show. Uh, when it comes to the interviews, uh, and depending on how many contestants total there are, we could have anywhere from eight to 12 contestants in each of the groupings and two contestants Test and handlers are assigned to that group. And during the interviews, they're all sequestered and we make sure that they're all ready and presentable to the, uh, the judges for their interview. Uh, with the handlers, there's also Team Shine that uh, are the boot blacking aficionados and make them look spotless once we have all their seams out straight then they get buffed. <laughs> what interesting uh, little stories can you tell us about having been a handler? You don't have to give names, but maybe mm -hmm. something that might be fun to share. Well, seeing how the contestants deal with <laughs> hall process and how they try to decompress, uh, and my sick sense of humor. Um, there was one contestant who was lying on the floor on his back and his knees were bent 
and one of the contestants who proceeded to go and win the title was lying with his head on the person's the back of his head on the person's crotch so i wheeled up to them and i said one more push just one more push i do it and uh they broke up laughing and it broke the <laughs> you know the when i first started after my year volunteering i was i did 3 years of doing security for the tally masters i've been through the I, I know the scoring process. I know the uh, um, how what the contestants are thinking, and uh, you know the only thing I haven't done is to be a judge at IML. But I, you know, that hopefully will change over time when they think I'm ready. <laughs> you know, so it's just it's more along the lines of. I understand what they're going through because sometimes a contestant's worst enemy is their is themselves because they're I had one contestant we were outside the judges chambers and he heard hysterical laughter coming from the chambers and he goes they're not laughing at him I said no they're laughing with him they don't throw tomatoes at us, do they? No, they don't throw tomatoes at us. <laughs> oh my! Now I I know as as a yeah. fellow contestant handler yeah. with you, I've yeah. worked with you for many years on that. Mm -hmm. We are handpicked for that team. Who right. was the den daddy that recruited you? I was first asked by oh my god joey wong george wong george wong sorry it's been that long <laughs> so, <laughs> you know and then uh you know so yeah i've been a handler for six seven years now okay given well, given the hiatus also included <laughs> right <laughs> It felt so weird this year to be the Memorial Weekend. Why aren't I in Chicago? <laughs> yes. for, for those who don't know, IML has held Memorial Day weekend in the United States. That's generally in the 20s of May. So what challenges have you had to manage as a handler? Sometimes it's the facility itself. There are ways of getting downstairs to the dressing chambers at the theater. Uh, I have to go a different way as opposed to everyone else. They can run up the stairs, but I've got to go through a uh, mechanical room, upper ramp to the elevators, which are in the next building, oh and then go through the loading dock, which comes out right backstage. And then I'm there. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's that. And that's how I had to take Laurent around when he was ready to be presented and uh, stuff like this. So it was, uh, it's all doable. The, when Jeff Tucker told us that, you know, they're going to be people staying behind when the top 20 is announced for support i basically said oh god i'm no good at stuff like that but knowing with all the talents that are in that pool of handlers that there are some extremely well uh nor knowledgeable people that can deal with the stress and the disappointment and the uh shock of not placing yeah the so, because I've heard horror stories of some of the contestants being, if you don't win, don't come back. Yeah. Which is the worst thing a title producer could do to his contestant. Yeah. Because especially with, uh, like at IML 40, there were, what, 73 contestants? So the odds were against them of even placing. 
Like you got a only a one third chance of placing. And what a lot of people don't realize is once the top 20 is chosen, their scores are then back to zero. Right. And then they're judged and it's that just the show that gets the score. For the benefit of the audience, it's Olympic scoring where the highest <laughs> and the lowest are dropped. Mm -hmm. The only time that the Olympic scoring is counted if there is a tie for first place. Has that ever happened that you know? I think it has. And know? the what happens is the score, the judges aren't sequestered, but they're within reach in case there's an issue. But if there's no issue, it's like, okay, thank you. Bye. <laughs> Interesting. I wasn't aware that that had ever happened. Okay. Now, a couple of years after you competed mm -hmm. and probably around the time you were about to become a handler yourself, Tyler McCormick won. He was Mr. New Mexico leather, I believe. He was. 2010. So, and he rather he's IML 2010. What were yeah, your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, he's IML 32. Yes, uh, I loved it. I when I heard that he was there, uh, I popped into the green room to say hi because I was working with the uh, tally masters again. So I had my security pass and and I you know I looked like one of the inmates. So I walked wheeled in. <laughs> <laughs> I also said hello to Leslie and stuff like that because Team Shine and all the other handlers were there. So I said hello and I went in and introduced myself and you know so got to know Tyler a little bit and it was it was nice. It was very nice. What were your feelings on seeing someone with a similar disability achieve that? Uh, being doing security, I heard his speech. And it was extremely powerful. Uh, he is very well, he's a very good communicator. Uh, you know, he, you know, I believe he's a social worker. So he, he knows he's a very good people person and stuff like that. So he has skills that I don't, you know, and he made the best first impression that they could meet because I've had, you know, some of the first impressions I've made or had when people meet me for the first time is I had one of the judges the year I competed at IML go, how can I judge you as a leatherman if I can't see your ass? How did you manage that? I told uh, some people that I didn't know that was a prerequisite to being a leatherman. It's what's in your heart and what's in your head that makes you a Leatherman. Right. And as I told our friend Karen, I said, if you can see my ass, two things have happened. Either I fall out of my wheelchair or I'm getting lucky. Either way, I might want your help. <laughs> <laughs> but yet I can't help but think that that had to be very insulting to hear. It was. How did you choose to respond to that? Uh, with humor. Hence the shield. <laughs> Shields can deflect and it can also make punishment if you thrust it back towards them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the scary part is I see him every year because he was with the production team. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel, and as I'm an outsider, clearly looking at this, but I feel that the reception of people with visible disabilities has gotten better over the years with uh, the title holder circuit. How do you see that? It has gotten better. The There are... Uh, 
contestants with multiple levels of disabilities from canes to braces. They have, you know, even, even gait issues, like they have a pristine limp uh, or uh, most people only think of uh, two, there are two types of disabilities where it becomes you're either a paraplegic or a uh, quadriplegic in wheelchairs. But there's also another form which is forgotten. It's a hemiplegic. I'm sorry? A hemiplegic, which is stroke patient. So it's hemisphere of the uh -huh. brain and a side of you is affected. Okay. So you're... Sometimes it's your speech, sometimes it's your walk, your arm is immobile, but you can limp. Or if you have, if you're sitting in a chair, you can use your good leg and one of your arms to push the chair and the other arm and your other leg are immobile. Okay. But that's hemiplegic. Is there anything you wish you had done differently in your leather journey? Yes. I was the, I was the type of person, especially in new, um, like I'm very outspoken, but in very new circumstances or new situations or new environments, I'm the type of person who will sit back and observe almost to the point of being a wallflower, just observing and watching, reading the room. But it's, you know, working with, Mr. Leather Ottawa and all those people. It's when I competed for I or for the local contest. I it came I came to the conclusion that like why am I sitting in the background? You know, when we when we I I've run um, the uh, registration. I've done leather swaps. I've done all these other. Organi organizing for the events and even the workshops and stuff being the coordinator for that but it was more along the lines of why am I sitting in the background in for IML 29 I was at IML and there was an war a Iraq war vet who was a single leg amputee his speech actually inspired me to run as opposed to sit in the background which contestant was that uh, his nickname was Captain Kirk. I do remember him, actually. Yes. Yeah. And I met Captain and his boy, my title year, in the lobby at IML. He came to introduce him to his himself. I stopped him, told him the story of how, why I'm there and how he inspired me and stuff like this. And... There was crying and hugs involved, and it was all messy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So. But that's uh, building upon how other people have responded to you, isn't it? You had someone who inspired you, and then you've inspired others. Correct. And I'm still, hopefully, I'm still doing that. Yeah. You know, yeah. People were coming up to me. Oh, I saw you at IML. I said, Sorry, I heard you. I didn't see you. Standing on stage, those bright lights, I couldn't see a damn thing. <laughs> heard you, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, you even mentioned uh, you see yourself as a Venus flytrap. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Not quite. I said a wallflower. <laughs> Someone who can be shy and quiet when I'm, you know, uh, in my leather family, there was a, uh, our sir, who unfortunately has just uh, passed a number of years back with leukemia. Uh, he calls it as quiet, or my quiet times is because uh, I sat in the background watching him at the, at the leather runs by the fireplace working on chain mail. You know, I just sit there and watch him without going and talking to him. So after a while, I, you know, a couple of years, I finally started talking to him. And that was the, uh, the sir, the head of our, the leather family, the 
the Vajra leather family and uh, the tattoo I have here is uh, is the Vajra. So, okay. What's the biggest misconception about you? Um, I'm only laughing because I, uh, a friend of mine in a Zoom chat saying, I've heard stories about you. And I'm going, oh, yeah, please elaborate. I called him on it. Mm-hmm. He says, well, you dye your beard. <laughs> okay. If that's the only thing that they're complaining about, I'm fine. You're like, <laughs> this is natural. I, this is, this is, I'm a ginger. I just have white coming down here. It's not highlights. It's natural gray. You know, yeah, you know, I've, I'll be 58 in March. So I don't care. <laughs> How do you see the leather scene in your area of Canada? How do you see that progressing in the next few years? Hopefully that we can find a way because I do understand that like things with pride and stuff, there are uh, um, events where the, the women want to hang with the women, the men want to hang with the men, but it's all about variety and choice. So have those spaces, but also have the poly or the mix spaces that you could go to say two or three of the spaces and all be comfortable so it's you know but you're getting a variety of stuff because if you all live in the same bubble you know you you know you can't grow your community or converse you know if the like you know if you just if you don't you don't want to hang around women how are you going to build the community so that it's stronger if you exclude the lesbians or even the bisexual people? Yeah. And now, this is back in my day, but now when you have the intersectionality of asexuals and uh, intersexed and, you know, uh, all the gender fluid or non-binary, individuals how do you navigate that so that you can bring them together for an event that celebrates where we've coming because right now there are people complaining about the not complaining but commenting loudly let's say of the transgender issue and i'm going well wait a minute they're 20 years behind the gay movement Oh, I never thought of it like that. Yeah, they're starting out, you know, they're starting out 20 years after us. What distinctions, differences do you see between the Canadian leather scene and, for example, the leather scene in the States or in Europe or other locations? In November, we don't sweat like you would in Palm Springs. Wearing your leathers. I had to go there. <laughs> Bad boy. Trying to get a straight answer out of a gay man. Good luck with that. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> um, I don't think that there is a... Dis- um, I don't know if there is a difference between the... The only difference would be the climate. The rest, the rest, like the, the weather, the rest is the same. Okay. Some are, some are cluckish, some aren't, you know, there, it, it runs the gamut. Okay. Yeah. Depending on what city you're in. Cause Montreal is very different than Ottawa and Ottawa is very different than Toronto. Ottawa is the government. Different? Well, Ottawa is the government town. People say at six o'clock in the evening, the downtown sidewalks, roll up and there's nothing there's nothing to do here so they'll go the two hours to montreal or the five hours to toronto for the weekend okay yeah there are people that i know here in ottawa that i don't see a lot i go down to montreal it's oh hi (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, Richard Hubley, thank you for a fascinating interview for Inside Leather History of Fireside Chat. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you enjoyed being had. It's been a while. Ha <laughs> <laughs>